What's up, everybody? It's your boy Ness with Apology of Today. And today we're not going to do any B-roll or music or special effects. You guys are just going to sit behind the scenes with me and we're going to have a Bible study. And we're going to be reading from Matthew 6. And we're going to talk about what should your focus be on and the consequences if your focus not on the right place. So if you go with me, flip over to Matthew 6, verse 19. And this is called Lay Up Your Treasures in Heaven. And it reads like this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where the thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, this is Jesus speaking here, and he's given us the difference between a man or a woman that focuses their attention, their treasures on earth instead of the things from above, the focus on him. And he breaks it down this way, that when you focus on the things here on earth, and that could be anything, that could be money, power, status, career, materialism, capitalism, attention, approval from other people. Those things are corruptible. Those things are not real. Those things don't last forever. And this is what Jesus is bringing to our attention is why is your focus on things that are not infinite? Things that are fake. As a matter of fact, on things that someone else can even come and steal from you. Instead, he gives us a better option. He says, focus, focus on the things of heaven. Focus on him. And there's a reason. Because no one can steal those things away from you. Those things are infinite. They don't corrupt. They don't fall apart. They don't rust. And then he says, if they focus on the things on, on earth, career, money, that is where their heart is. And then Jesus further explains how, how can we stay on that track? How do we focus on the things of heaven instead of the things on earth? Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, your eye is good. Your whole body will be full of light. Now, I'll stop right there because a lot of people take that specific verse and take it out of context when it comes to new age ideology, Hinduism, uh, or this whole new age Christianity, third eye nonsense. It is not speaking at all within its context about that. What it's talking about is focusing on Jesus Christ because he is the light of the world, as we know in John and in Genesis. He is the true light, not just the light of the world, but he is the true light. And if you focus on the true light, then your whole body will be filled with light, not because of the power that's in you or, you, or any divine spark, which is Gnosticism. is so oh, dumb. It's made up ideology, right? Saying that Jesus is the true light. When you focus on him, his light shines through you. Your whole body is filled with light. But it has to do with what you focus on. When you, when you stare at a television, that's what you focus on. When you're reading a book, that is what you focus on. He's saying focus on him and you will be filled with light. But then again, there's a consequence when you don't focus on him or when you don't focus on the true light. And that is this, verse 23. But if your eye is bad, which means you have not, your focus is away from the Lord your whole body will be full of darkness. The consequence. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? Now I'm going to break this down even further. What type of reality television shows do you spend most of your time on? Do you spend your time on having a relationship with God through his word, because that is how he speaks to us. Or instead, every time you have the, the, the time 
to read your Bible. Instead, you spend it on Netflix, on ridiculous reality shows or really dark demonic shows. Or what type of music are you pumping in through your ears? Creating some horrible imagery or or uh, an emotional negative response, an evil spiritual response. If you did not know, those are open doors. The Bible says that the enemy is very subtle. Do not be fooled by how he attacks, the Apostle Paul talks about. So when you don't focus on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, what's in you is darkness. Not anything else. Don't fool yourself. But when you focus on Jesus, then all you have is light, the true light. Now, we do know, according to Scripture, that there is a false light. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul exposes this and says that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. As a matter of fact, like I've said before in most of my videos, the majority of false religions, that's exactly how they started off. By an isolated event between a man or a woman, never claiming to see God, but claiming to see an angel of light, masquerading themselves as an angel of light, the devil. And then the common attack is, the number one common denominator is the Bible's corrupted. The New Testament is corrupted. I must give you a new revelation. It's the same attack. When you read the Quran, uh, how the uh, Jehovah Witness got started, how uh, Joseph Smith got his word, and Mormonism started back in the 1800s, it's exactly that. A false light attacking the real scriptures. But what did God tell us about that? He says that my word will never pass away. So that is a promise. If it never passes away, how can someone say later on, this is corrupted? It's an attack. It's very subtle from the devil. Verse 24, it says you cannot serve God in riches. You cannot serve God in money. And it reads like this. No one can serve two masters. Now I'll stop right there. You notice how Jesus describes two people in charge of you. That's what a master is, in control of you. And, it's, and he's talking about himself, God, and money. Money is a master. But we'll go ahead and we're going to continue reading this, right? It says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other you cannot serve god and mammon mammon is money mammon is a false god an idol a replacement and if you've never seen or viewed money in this way there's nothing wrong with money as long as you got god first then you got a blessing then you know how to use it. There's no attachment. You don't care if you do lose it. Matter of fact, you give it away generously because your heart is in the Lord, not money. But when you reverse those two, there's always seems to be some type of a struggle. Every time you see someone who has an abundance of money and then they know God, money tends to have more control over that person. There's a sense of, of, of security. It's a security blanket. Well, I've known this before I've known you. Yes, I know of your existence. Yes, I know you are God and you are great. But this has taken care. This, is, this has protected me and has given me everything that I've needed before I met you. Technically, that's what it's doing. That's why he says you cannot serve two masters. Because when you love money, you will either despise God or you will hate him. Money is a false God. Whatever you feel that you need, you can gain, you can buy through money. And as time goes on, especially in Western culture, because we have abundance, you tend to not lean towards God because everything you've ever wanted, you've obtained through money. That's what he says. Be careful with that. Be careful who you serve. Serve God and God alone. 
Because if it's opposite, you will hate him that, or despise him or walk away from him. Right? So, so far, what do we know? Lay up your treasures in heaven. And why? The benefits of that. The lamp of the body. What you should be focused on. Right? This is how the Christian walk should look like. This is what empowers you. You can't do this on your own. You're doing it by focusing, having a relationship with God through his word, spending time with him through his word, and then focusing on Christ because he is the true light. And then he ends this with knowing all this, you should not worry then. Knowing this, you shouldn't worry. And he says this, verse 25, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, right there, that's already a hard statement for many to do. But remember, who's the one that gave it to you, right? It says, what you will eat, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. So right now, he's talking about essentials for survival. Don't worry about these things, but he's going to get to a point. Nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So right now, Jesus is saying, don't worry about these things, about how you're going to obtain them. Water, food, clothing, essentials, right? Because if you worry about that, then you're not trusting the Lord that he will provide. Because that's what he is. He is a provider, right? And then he gives us a very interesting example so that we can think about. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. All right. So, and that's true. Many of us don't spend enough time in looking into God's creation. Like he said, the birds, the birds don't worry about where they're going to sleep. They get fed. They have shelter and they don't gather. And they don't sow and they don't reap. They're not doomsday preppers. I need to be ready. Okay. God provides for them. And they know it. They are always fed. They are always taken care of, right? And so what he's saying is, if I do that with this, these animals, right? And they're lesser than you. How much more can I, will, how much more can I do for you? Right? So it says, and he, he compares that. He compares both. He says... Are you not more of value than they are? And he provides for the, for the birds, but are you not more valuable than, than these birds? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So right there, he's just being very logical. He's talking about, I provide for the birds. Are you not more than they? And when was the last time that by worrying you were able to gain anything? Were you physically able to get taller? Were you physically able to accomplish and get what it is that you were stressing about without relying that God will provide for you in that way? Without praying to him that he will provide for you that way? Or are you in control? Being in control and removing God never accomplishes or gives you anything. And that is what he's saying there. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So he's talking about the lilies and how beautiful they look. God did that. They don't clothe themselves. They don't sew they don't sew these beautiful, uh, colorful patterns. That is the creator, right? And it says, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown down into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Then he says, oh, you of little faith. That's a, that's a powerful statement. God is saying, look at the lilies and how they're clothed, but they don't last. Trust him that he will provide 
that he will clothe you, that he will feed you, that he will take care of you as long as it's in his will. If it's the things and the desires of his heart and you are abiding in him, then he will provide because desires of your heart are in his will. Verse 31, therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Okay? What he's saying is, this is what non-believers, this is how non-believers act. Okay? So, this is talking to the believer. And if you're a non-believer listening to this message, this is what God can do to you. Is remove the burden, that yoke, that spiritual prison that got that that Satan has put you in, but to the believer. He says, don't be like the non-believer. Don't be like those that want to be in control. Right? And it says, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. He's not oblivious. He knows all things. God knows what you need. And he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God knows what you need. If it's suffering from sickness, if it's family members that are not saved and you're struggling with that, if it's, uh, if it's issues in the workplace or if it's financial, whatever it is. To the believer, God knows what you need and that you need these things. If there are things in his will, things that truly matter, not things of the world. But seek his righteousness first. It says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the Lord. Seek his goodness. And it says, and all these things will be added to you. It's not saying maybe or possibly. But it reminds me of John 15. When it ends, it's a spiritual contract in John 15. And it says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. Then you can ask for things and they will be given to you. Now, this is not no law of attraction or the secret or speaking into the universe nonsense. It's been on my vision board for years. It's a law of attraction. But what he's saying is that if you abide in him, in his word, you have relationship with him daily, he changes the condition of your heart and the things that you truly want. He frees you. But he also knows that there are essentials that you need. Seek him first and he will provide. I hope that you enjoyed this message today from Matthew 6. Do not worry. If you like this content, like, subscribe, leave a comment. God bless you in Jesus' name.